Before we begin, let's review our learning objectives. After viewing this program, you'll be able to describe why a dialogue between patient and provider can help improve the quality of care and outcomes. Identify key considerations in implementing Choosing Wisely recommendations within your organization and develop key strategies to implement Choosing Wisely with your community partners. You're an important part of our program and we want to hear from you. As usual, towards the end of the program, we'll have time for question and answers and here's how you can join us. Just chat with us online by sending us your question or comments at any time, type your message and click submit, and you're part of the discussion. And now let's meet our special guest. First, Dr. Rob Dressler. Rob, welcome to the program. Please tell us about your background and your contribution to this work. Uh, thank you, Robert, and it's great to be here. So I'm the Quality and Safety Officer for Academic and Medical Affairs at Christiana Care. I'm also the team lead for eBright Health, a statewide Choosing Wisely initiative. Great, thank you for joining us and looking forward to your contributions. Also with us today is Dr. Ali Shogun. Ali, welcome. Please tell us about your background and your work in this area as well. I'm a hospital medicine physician and medical instructor at Duke University Health System. I'm one of the leads on Duke's Choosing Wisely grant. I became involved with the program during residency and have stayed on as a new faculty member, and I'm excited to be here today. Great, we're glad to have you. And finally, we welcome Dr. Mark Williams. Mark, welcome to the program. Please Thank tell you. us a little bit about yourself, please. Appreciate the honor of coming here. Um, I'm also a hospital medicine physician, and I'm vice chair of the Department of Internal Medicine and chief of the Division of Hospital Medicine at the University of Kentucky Healthcare, and serve as director of our Center for Health Services Research. Great, glad to have you with us. Can you give us a little rationale behind the Choosing Wisely initiative? Yeah, no, I'd be happy to. Um, value in healthcare is routinely described authoritatively, actually, by many people. Yet, like the famous parable of the blind men describing an elephant, it all depends on your perspective. Um, different people see different things related to value in healthcare. Um, however, we know that probably 15 to 20 percent of clinical care is not appropriate, it's not needed. Dr. Don Burke, who is the former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the founder of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, said that one of three American healthcare dollars is wasted. And over the past decade and more, our wage increases have literally been absorbed by healthcare costs. So the people of the United States have not felt the benefit of raises in salaries, they've just paid more in healthcare. So if we know that there's a high level of, of unnecessary or wasted care, what's driving it? So I think what's driving it is a lot of is our payment system. Um, Brent James, one of the gurus in quality improvement, was interviewed in the New York Times Magazine, and as he said, the fee-for-service payment system, in other words, paying for volume of care, combined with our instincts as care providers, physicians, and those of patients, encourages more testing and treatments. We're trying to do more, though necessarily doing less might be better. We're not sure which tests and treatments make a difference, but we keep ordering them, patients keep receiving them, and costs keep rising. And additionally, fear of malpractice litigation leads to something referred to as defensive medicine. Estimated costs have been as high as $46 billion annually. And remarkably, in a study done out of Northwestern by Kevin O'Leary, um, found that all medical students and residents encounter defensive medicine practices during their training, and thus they're taught to consider this in their clinical decision making. So ironically, this creates a burden for the provider, right? More complexity, more things to keep track of. But it also impacts patients very negatively, all this unnecessary utilization. Y yes, absolutely. When you undertake a test that's not needed, then it can cause harm. Um, we were very fortunate to receive funding from PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, to specifically look at care transitions as patients go from the hospital to home. Um, this is what you're doing in your health systems, is managing these care transitions. In Project Achieve, we set out initially to learn what matters most to patients and their caregivers to have a successful transitions of care. And they were very clear in what they communicated to us. Patients and their caregivers want to feel cared for and cared about. They want to feel prepared and confident and capable that they can take care of themselves once they leave the safe environment of the hospital as they perceive it with all this help from nurses and physicians and pharmacists to go home and be on their own. Think about it. Probably 99.9% .9 of healthcare is occurring in people's homes, not in hospitals and clinics. And then this is critically important. 
patients and the fam their family caregivers, they want to know who is responsible and accountable unambiguously for their care as they're going through this care transition as they see it as continuity of care. Can you tell us more about the research? Yeah, I'd be glad to. So key aspects of this um, are been laid out in our qualitative research where we were looking at what patients um, were concerned about. And there were three big themes. First of all was communication. As you can see in the slide, this concept that the communication to the patients and family caregivers is supportive. It's collaborative and it has a purpose. So it's not just someone talking at them, but talking with them, finding out what they need to know and providing that. Second, that we anticipate the needs of patients and their family caregivers. We as employees of the health system, physicians, nurses, pharmacists. We do this every day. We've taken care of literally thousands of patients. This is often a first time experience or a relatively rare experience. People don't live in the hospital, hopefully. They're mainly at home and they want to know what is going to happen when they leave the hospital and they expect us to know because we do this every day. And then finally this concept of continuity of care and basically that we as healthcare providers, that you and your health systems are ensuring that there's continuous communication and seamless care as patients transition from the hospital to a skilled nursing facility to home health care and to being home on their, on their own and not multiple different people who aren't talking to each other. What do we need to do to improve on this current fee-for-service environment that we're in? How, how can we decrease unnecessary utilization in that environment. Yeah, I think the big issue here is basically figuring out how to go from paying for volume of care delivered versus paying for value of care delivered. And I think the process to do that is to become a learning health system. And this is basically where your health system is using the best evidence, the best science, partnering it with health information technology, and importantly, having a culture where incentives are aligned to continually improve care and use innovation to do that. It's where your best practices are seamlessly embedded in the care process, in your electronic health records if possible, um, to reinforce the best habits. It's where patients and family caregivers are active participants in all elements of care delivery. They're not just purely recipients, they're partners. And that new knowledge that you learn from this can then be applied to improve care even further as we um, are delivering it. Can you delve a little deeper into the characteristics of a learning health system? Sure, and thankfully, uh, the federal government funded through the National Academy of Medicine a terrific report about learning health systems, and they identified seven critical components. First and most important to me is that you and I partner with the patients and family caregivers that we serve that you use your health information technology effectively through your electronic health record um, to integrate best practices, that you have data that downloads into data warehouses so you can evaluate what's happening, that you can apply evidence as it's published in journals real time quickly, not after years and years of delay. And then as you're applying this new evidence, you learn from the care delivery processes. You learn what works, you learn what's not working and change care accordingly. And this is actually doing this is simply research and I think when you perform what I refer to as research caliber quality improvement you get change that sticks and stays in place and then as you know our patients are getting sicker and more complex the systems are getting uh, more complex walk into your ICU and look at how complex care is we've got to have systems to manage that complexity we need to make health care safer for patients so that we're not causing harm by ordering tests that aren't needed, for example. And then I think improving transparency so that all caregivers know how well we're doing when we deliver care, they know the outcomes, patients and family caregivers are also seeing these outcomes, and through this transparency, we'll identify mistakes, learn from them, also learn from our successes, and can integrate them. And then lastly, accomplish this by promoting teamwork and communication among all members of the team. And that team is big these days. It's the leaders of your health system, it's the clinician, it's the researchers, it's the patients and family caregivers, and it's the community. And then finally, by doing that, implementing uh, the best practices, by engaging all the stakeholders and the patients and their family caregivers, we can decrease waste and increase efficiency, as is shown by the Choosing Wisely campaign.
That's great. Uh, almost all of us in healthcare are lifelong learners, so this learning health system really resonates with that. Rob, we know that choosing wisely really focuses on decreasing unnecessary care and waste. What's the physician perspective on this? You know, that's a real interesting question. You know, I've been in practice for over 30 years, and the conversation about unnecessary tests really is not a new one. It, but we've changed the way that we're talking about it because we recognize it. And one of the pivotal things that created the change in conversation is that we got some data. There was a national survey that revealed that physicians know overuse is a serious problem. About three-quarters of physicians report unnecessary tests and procedures, while half of physicians report um, uh, request unnecessary, uh, patients request unnecessary tests or procedures on a weekly basis. Similar percentage of uh, physicians say that this happens frequently and would order unnecessary tests when procedures are caring for an insistent patient. Mark, how do we care optimally for patients, especially the sickest patients in our yeah, systems. and that's a growing population in the United States. And we know that our health care delivery and spending on health care is concentrated on care of the sick. About 5% of patients may be responsible up to 50% of costs. And that's understandable. That's how health care systems should work. But we can uh, be more effective. It's very important, especially for patients suffering from behavioral health issues. They're particularly vulnerable. Um, and often their mental health issues go unaddressed. Thus, we may um, undertake unnecessary necessary tests and procedures to treat their symptoms when we're not treating the underlying process. And then importantly, palliative care. Now this is defined actually as alleviating patients and family caregivers' physical and mental suffering. It's treating their symptoms. It's talking with them to identify what are their goals of care and matching our treatment and our diagnostic efforts toward those goals of care. And we found from research that when we delay delivering palliative care to patients, the outcomes are not what we want. Um, when this happens, that means the family caregivers are at risk of post-traumatic stress disorder at five-fold levels. There's a nearly nine-fold increase in the risk of prolonged grief disorders. And we've also found from very good research published in the New England Journal of Medicine that when you integrate palliative care into typical cancer care, patients' lifespans are actually increased and costs are reduced. Who doesn't want that? Better care less costs. There's also additional research reinforcing this. It shows that when you add palliative care to home care for Medicare pay beneficiaries that have multiple chronic illnesses who are chronically ill, it reduces unnecessary utilization, thus unnecessary ED visits, and it reduces their depression. Great information. Let's shift gears a little bit. Rob, we've talked about what drives unnecessary utilization and, and how it impacts us negatively. Can you describe how choosing wisely addresses overuse and unnecessary utilization? Sure. Um, so what Choosing Wisely has accomplished, it's provided an excellent platform to touch on many of the key points that uh, Mark has talked about in regards to communication with patient. It forces and promotes a conversation between physicians and their patients, which leads to shared decision making and patient engagement. And these are five questions that each of us, when we've been patients, when you've been patients, always ask ourselves. Are the, are, is this test or procedure necessary? What are the risks involved with those, this test? Is there a simpler, safer option? And what happens if I choose to do nothing? And how much does this cost? And today, this last point is particularly important because of the uh, era of high deductible insurance plans. And think about if we all asked ourselves those questions while we're caring for others. That would mm -hmm. really be impactful. Allie, can you give us a little more background on the Choosing Wisely initiative? Sure, Robert. So most of you are probably familiar with Choosing Wisely on some level, but it's a wonderful initiative by the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation and Consumer Reports and focuses on decreasing unnecessary and wasteful medical tests and procedures. Now this initiative was originally piloted back in 2010 with the five things idea. And through that, through five things, a list of subspecialties put out five recommendations to decrease overuse or potentially unnecessary tests. This idea caught on and continued to grow, and then in 2012, the ABIM and Consumer Reports officially la launched the Choosing Wisely national campaign as we know it today. 
And as Rob had mentioned, the goal here is really to foster conversations between patients and providers and encourage them to ask those five questions that he referenced and question the need for tests, treatments, and procedures. Choosing Wisely has done great work. They've partnered with a variety of organizations to try to reach patients and providers through a variety of different avenues. And since the campaigns went national, what's happened? It's had great success, and really awareness and support have only continued to grow. Back in 2013, Choosing Wisely provided 21 grants in conjunction with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And now Duke was not involved in this initial round of grants, but we looked at the work that was done through that first round when we were working towards getting our own grant in 2015. Um, looking back at that initial pilot data, there are obviously some barriers and challenges as there are with any new initiative. And some of those included competition for providers' time and energy. We all have significant clinical responsibilities, multiple different leadership and quality initiatives being rolled out all the time. There was some concern for financial and public relations um, from hospitals and health systems with taking this step to become a learning health system and acknowledge that everything we're doing is not always perfect and there is some care that may be unnecessary or avoidable. And then as many of you know, there's always challenges around getting accurate data and gathering accurate, timely, measurable outcomes. But despite all these challenges, Duke was still very interested in becoming involved with Choosing Wisely because of these great success stories that were out there. So as many of us know, antibiotics is an issue at the forefront nationally in antibiotic overuse. Um, one area in particular is antibiotics prescribed for upper respiratory infections, the vast majority of which are viral and therefore antibiotics have no role in treatment and actually may cause harm. Virginia Mason, excuse me, Virginia Mason took this head on. Um, they issued a clinic, clinical decision support program and had great success dropping their antibiotic prescription rates for upper respiratory infections by more than half. So they went from 41.8% in 2011 down to 18.6% in 2014. Other sites have also had great success with their initiatives. Vanderbilt with their daily labs project, um, giving individual and group feedback. Um, and then multiple sites um, of note, Washington State has had significant um, impact on a variety of Choosing Wisely initiatives through a multimodal approach. Those are some great results. Before you launched this at Duke, what other information did you review? Well, I think one of the most important things that we decided to look at was the importance of focus. Mm -hmm. Um, choosing Wisely with this great success has continued to grow. It started with this list of five things, as I mentioned. Now there are over 70 lists from specialties and subspecialties, um, with adding up to over 500 individual recommendations for tests and procedures. And so looking at that can obviously be daunting in trying to figure out where to start. So we looked at our health system's needs and combined that with the Choosing Wisely list and decided to focus on a few recommendations. Great, thank you. We recently interviewed physician leaders from two different organizations who talked about how they've been involved in the Choosing Wisely campaign and what they have seen so far. Let's take a look.
So I think great expert uh, sharing their experience of choosing wisely with us. The issue of a narrow focus and implementation, really using data and uh, getting providers to engage around this uh, along with issues like initiative fatigue. What are your thoughts on this? I think that one of the key takeaways from both of these health systems doing great work is that they have different targets and they're going about it in different ways. And so there doesn't need to be this prescriptive one size fits all approach. Everything can be individualized to your own health system but that we can all learn from each other. And all of us are willing to share our work with each other to continue to build off of it. Yeah, I think just, just getting started. You get started and you start getting change and then your clinicians will get engaged and they'll want more change. And, and lastly, I think another element is the, uh, the aspect of focus. Uh, groups at your organization, at our organization, frequently try to boil the ocean and have tremendous scope and focusing so you have a place to really start getting a full foothold, starting, and then uh, moving forward. Small test of change. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Allie, can you describe how Duke got involved in choosing wisely? I would love to. So Duke, as Mark had mentioned, strives to continuously be a learning health system um, with ongoing process improvement. And our leadership is very devoted to ensuring we're providing the best patient care. Um, so as part of this, we became involved with the North Carolina Collaborative and Choosing Wisely. So North Carolina Collaborative is spearheaded by the North Carolina Healthcare Quality Alliance, one of our local quality organizations. And through them, they've brought together Duke Health, Cornerstone Healthcare, the North Carolina Medical Society, Blue Cross Blue Shield, State Health Plan, all organizations from different venues to work together and try to approach this project um, from multi-pronged. So in conjunction with those organizations, Duke was awarded a three-year grant back in 2015, the second round of grants, as I mentioned earlier. And the goal of this Choosing Wisely grant is really to reduce potentially unnecessary prescriptions and procedures by 20% over three years. Our project leader is Dev Sangvai, who I've been lucky enough to work with over the past few years on this. And Dev is a family medicine physician practicing at Duke. He's also the executive director for Duke Connected Care, our accountable care organization, which is key in tying this all together because we really do see limiting potentially avoidable care as a key part of the transition to value, as Robert mentioned. So we heard in the video a narrow focus initially is very important for success. What did that look like at Duke? Very important for success. I don't think any of us can drive that home enough. Um, our primary focus was on antibiotics in acute bronchitis, realizing that this had a widespread impact across our health system through many clinics, the emergency department, all kinds of settings. And then the two other initiatives that Duke is looking at and really just starting to ramp up more recently are screening carotid ultrasounds in asymptomatic patients and bone density testing or DEXA scans in normal risk patients under age 65. So once you landed on antibiotics to focus, how did you begin the implementation of choosing wisely? So before we started to roll out interventions, we really wanted to take time to take stock um, and gather what was going to be important from our organization, which is what I would recommend to all of you also. So the first key step for us was support from clinical and hospital leadership, getting their buy-in, um, choosing a metric, as I mentioned, that was a target that was clinically significant and also had the opportunity for patient activation and involvement, because this is really a two-way street that we're talking about here. Um, next was choosing and defining accurate and timely metrics, which can be one of the most difficult things, as many of you know. Um, for the purposes of our grant, we used the AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality mm -hmm. Data around antibiotics in acute bronchitis. We wanted to really validate this data, so we had two different departments at Duke run a data poll from our EMR and then did some case review to establish a clear baseline that we could measure. And then, as with any project that you're undertaking at your organization, physician champions on the ground are key. You need the leadership for the top-down approach, and then physicians and the clinical ground staff for bottom-up approach. Um, we created working groups around the antibiotics initiative, and really the area that we thought would have the highest impact and had the greatest interest in this initiative was Duke Primary Care, particularly Drs. Kevin Shaw um, and John Anderson. And then we reviewed our stakeholders at play we um, 
being sure not to leave out insurance companies and these community organizations, and as Mark mentioned, really putting the patients at the forefront there. A key for us that um, you want to make sure not to forget as well is that we looked for other quality improvement initiatives going on at Duke. It's a huge health system. Um, it's easy to get stuck in your own silo. Uh, and you want to really look for synergies out there to make sure that you're not duplicating work and that we're all working together towards the same goal. And then we developed our multi-pronged approach with continuous learning, a PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act cycle, and continuing to refine. So you set the organization up for success. Now how did you really focus on reducing antibiotic use? So our first step, um, which we hit the ground running with almost immediately within the first month or two of the grant, was launching lunch and learns at primary care practices. We were fortunate that some of these were already scheduled through other Duke antibiotic initiatives. And then we also started to raise patient awareness, which some of our partners were doing at a community level, and we did at Duke through targeted waiting room brochures and exam room posters. And uh, can we take a look at one of those posters? That would be great. Um, so there are a variety of pre-made brochures and posters available on the Choosing Wisely website. They want to help you. They will tweak these for you, Spanish, English, whatever you need. Um, and so what you're seeing now is one of the five questions antibiotics posters, a little bit of a variation on the five general questions that Rob reviewed earlier. So this poster goes through, do I really need antibiotics? What are the risks of antibiotics? Um, are there simpler, safer treatment options that I could do instead of this? And then talking about how much they may cost to your patients and how do you take the antibiotics safely? Great. Rob, Christiana Care has been involved at a little larger scale statewide. Can you describe what implementation in that arena looks like? I'd be happy to. And similar to what Ali described at Duke, you're going to hear this, a lot of the same recurrent themes. This is just done at a community level as opposed to within a specific organization. So uh, like many of you, uh, you've been involved in formation and operation of ACOs. In, in Delaware, we formed our ACO roughly uh, three or four years ago. Out of that, 18 months ago, eBright Health was formed uh, with five acute care health systems inside of the state of Delaware. What's been really fun about this is now we're collaborating with our uh, like organizations in the state, and we have to recognize that these vary from small hospitals to large tertiary care medical centers. So our collaborative partners in the state include Bay Health, BB, Nanticoke, and Nemours, which is a children's hospital. So out of this uh, eBright Health, we created a task force, uh, uh, which is a work group looking at how to create Choosing Wisely and deploy that across the state. So the first thing that we did, uh, which is a necessary first state, is, is to understand your current state, which for us was understanding the differences and the similarities between our organizations, the differences where they are in the conversation, and understanding their differences and capabilities. And then after we uh, understood that, we, similarly to Duke, decided on choosing antibiotics. And many states have done this because it's a really easy area to put, wrap your arms around and a place to really begin the conversation because our challenge was learning how to collaborate with other organizations. So we wanted to pick an easier topic to, to cut our teeth on, so to speak. Um, after we did that, we did a stakeholder analysis to see uh, who we needed to bring to the table and we invited state and national organizations to collaborate this. And while many of you can think about and figure out who your usual cast of characters are, I want to highlight a couple of important ones that we came across. First of all, it goes without saying that having ABIM Foundation at the table is really tremendous. As Ali has talked about, they, they have tremendous information, they have a great network, and they really can connect you. Next, we all recognize that uh, skilled nursing facilities are a big part of that, and even though they're just beginning in understanding the impact of this through their Medicare regulations, they've brought some interesting points to the table that we needed to understand earlier. And lastly, we just added um, uh, the Delaware Better Business Bureau, which we're really excited about, because here we now have a person at the table who can present the patient perspective who's not a healthcare professional. And that's an important reflective exercise for us. Additionally, she will represent uh, small businesses who, as we all know, are very interested and concerned about healthcare costs and buying insurance. So we brought all these stakeholders to get to stakeholders together to have an initial meeting in April, we, and we developed our structure for the statewide learning network. And I think we have something that displays what that structure looks like. 
Yes, uh, we do. So what you can see on, on the slide uh, is that uh, we ha in this middle row, we have three areas of focus. Uh, first of all, we have to collaborate and coordinate uh, with our stakeholders because many of them are doing the same work and we don't want to confuse our uh, patients and our providers. And most importantly, we're focused on collaborating and coordinating our institutional teams because they are the soldiers that are out there doing the work and we need to give them direction and give them tools to be successful. And lastly, as been discussed, we need data. We, need, we have to measure the impact at the state, and right now we're in the search of, of that data so we can tell our story uh, better and also understand areas for opportunities for improvement. And coordination of institutional teams? Yeah, the bottom row on this graphic shows what we're doing. And, and again, this is to help move our teams forward to be successful. We're developing toolkits with many of our collaborators at the table. We have a monthly teleconference which facilitates the teams and, and gets them to move forward. And we're very excited about our quarterly face-to-face -face all team meetings where we bring all teams, all organizations together so we can learn one another. And lastly, we're creating milestones with dashboards for feedback. Um, and what you can see, uh, so we can talk about the, uh, the milestones and what you see on the graphic on the left-hand side is that we're, uh, these are very typical project management uh, milestones. Pre-work, understanding background, how we're going to measure success, what methods should you be using in order to uh, move, uh, improve? How do you implement? How do you measure success? And as Ali talked about, how do you uh, adjust and sustain based on what you're learning? Application of quality and performance at a high level, at a, at a large scale. Yes. Uh, you decided to focus on antibiotics. How does this look at, look in each organizational team? And that's a really important point, Robert. So what we needed to do, because all our organizations are different, as I mentioned earlier, is we set the vision to focus on antibiotics in, in upper respiratory infections. But we also wanted uh, something in the, in the arena of ambulatory, and we also wanted something in the area of inpa uh, inpatient focus. Uh, so that allows each organization to customize the project to meet their needs, their capabilities, and where their conversation is. So both of you started with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Allie, what are your results look like at Duke? So far, the results have been promising for us. As I mentioned, phase one was really just information and education to patients and providers to get the message out there. In phase two, I think we have a graphic of it, you'll note that we started to send out data at a physician and practice level to primary care and urgent care sites around late 2015. Um, and started to actually see a tick down in our numbers there. It was staying pretty flat with just the educational campaigns by themselves. Um, and then later in 2016, we actually formally tied um, the performance of antibiotic rates, prescription rates for acute bronchitis to physician performance incentives. And you can see another inflection point shortly after that where we have a further decrease in our antibiotic prescription rates. So we are pleased that we've met the goal 20% reduction. Obviously still want to continue to improve as there's ongoing room to learn here. Those are great results. Were there any lingering challenges, issues with providers in this work? There have definitely been some challenges along the way, although overall the initiative has been well received. The things that we initially heard from physicians as feedback were concerns around the patient experience, um, if patients were going to be frustrated that they had come in expecting antibiotics and were not leaving with what they had wanted. Um, and we were able to allay some of those concerns by looking at prior data that showed that as long as providers were taking the time to talk through that shared decision-making process with patients, the patient expectation or patient satisfaction was not changing significantly. But with that increased time talking, there was all also concerns around efficiency. Um, and it, to help with that, we've worked to incorporate more of the office staff, not just on the provider by themselves, but also the nurses, people that are rooming the patients, the front office, to really help set expectations from the time the patient arrives in clinic. And then there were some concerns initially around loss of autonomy. And we've worked to really bring people in on the ground level, all of our stakeholders, to include them in this process. And, help make it feel like it's not a mandate coming down from the top. 
uh, with any initiative, there's challenges of maintaining leadership buy-in, like we talked about before. I'm sure you've all seen this at your organization. There's competing priorities, both from a leadership QI perspective, as well as clinical responsibilities in a busy primary care practice. So working to sustain your improvement. Um, and then as the project leadership, we had concern and wanted to look more into something we've dubbed diagnosis drift. So for example, instead of diagnosing acute bronchitis, which is the metric we're watching, we're wondering if people instead may be choosing to diagnose upper respiratory infection or cough. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we were actually improving patient care and having an impact, not just meeting a number. So to look at this, Duke Primary Care pulled data on acute bronchitis plus seven to 10 additional upper respiratory infection diagnoses. And the data was actually quite favorable and showed that the rates of antibiotic prescription had fallen across all of these diagnoses, suggesting that our interventions were leading to overall practice improvement. Mark, I know that much of your work, uh, your leadership in this area has been through the Society of Hospital Medicine. Can you talk a little bit about that and your early experience at UK Healthcare? Yeah, sure, I'd be delighted. Um, I think hospital medicine physicians and the whole specialty of hospital medicine has established quality improvement as a key aspect of its culture. Um, this dates all the way back when we, a small group of us, put together the Society of Hospital Medicine Leadership Academy back in 2005. And our goal was to train young leaders in this new specialty because they asked us to do that. Keep in mind, this is the fastest growing specialty in the history of American medicine with more than 50,000 hospitals now across the United States. And we very early on recognized how essential teamwork was as a component of care delivery. We knew as, that we had to engage frontline staff. We had to then identify current processes and how they could be improved, develop potential interventions, and then through small tests of change, the PDSA, if you will, and we actually like to use at UK Healthcare, we call it focus PDSA, so that we cone down on the real issue and then use rapid cycles of change to improve things to do that. We also have what we call optimal care initiatives where we bring the best evidence in the literature to care delivery. But one of our, I think, groundbreaking initiatives that we've recently implemented is something we call ITEM. Our chief nursing officer came up with this, and ITEM stands for Interdisciplinary Team Innovation Model. And so this approach is bringing together pharmacists, nurses, especially the bedside nurse, case managers and the physicians to round on the patients on a daily basis communicate with them, identify their plan of care for the day, and ensure that it gets delivered. And um, it, this has been very effective in reducing costs, reducing unnecessary medication utilization, reducing unnecessary tests, and improving care. And our patient satisfaction levels have gone up dramatically. In fact, on some of our medicine floors, we won the patient satisfaction award, which I've never heard of on a medicine <laughs> board before. I love it. I love the focus on the team. What do you see as your next steps? So I think it's we need to expand choosing wisely um, at UK, but across all clinical specialties. It, globally, it's important to spread choosing wisely across the nation. It needs to be moved into your community hospitals, into your academic medical centers, into community practices, and into the populations they serve. We have to figure out how do we engage our patients and family care, caregivers um, that are a part of our population. This is population health. Um, if we are thoughtful and um, think about what is the appropriate best test for patients, they're going to benefit as will their family caregivers. Also, we have to figure out how do we integrate this into our data warehouses so we can have the data, so that we can have dashboards. I think you know well that if you can have clear display of outcomes at your institution, this is transparent, people will get aligned together. At our institution, we have something we call academic service lines, so that patients who come in with a cardiovascular um, issue, they've got the top-notch team working with them. Same thing if they come in with a cancer issue. But importantly, it's not just a clinical service line. It also has this academic component where we're conducting research on how can we do better. Um, and I think with global incentives to achieve better patient outcomes, having uh, transparency, then we can tie into what is our mission. We all went into healthcare, at least I did and I know you did. You went into healthcare to help people and improve their life, relieve, relieve suffering. And I think a mission-driven incentives really drive changes in care delivery. Yeah, that mission being so important to all of us. 
Rob, can you describe what you see as next steps at eBright Health? Sure. And, um, you know, while we're very proud with what we've accomplished in just nine short months, uh, like Mark articulated, we have a sense of urgency that we need to grow this and grow it bigger. Um, so like you, uh, we need to broaden our conversation within our community. We need to continue to promote our institutional, institutional team successes uh, through an all-teach, all-learn model. Uh, we're evaluating our statewide collaborator to optimize inclusivity. And we need to work towards obtaining data to measure statewide impact. And then uh, lastly, we're beginning our conversation, what are we going to do in conjunction with our antibiotic efforts? Exactly. Allie, uh, how is this progressing at Duke? What's next? So we have a lot of next steps that we're looking towards. Um, the first is to spread our antibiotics initiative from just the Duke primary care and urgent care sites really across all of our outpatient clinics, in addition to looking at other inpatient antibiotic initiatives like Rob has mentioned. We're also continuing to discuss tie-ins with our elect electronic medical record, both in terms of possible clinician decision support or growing our physician dashboard to give real-time feedback with the caution, obviously, and the caveat to avoid alert fatigue and overloading physicians, because we want our message to stay relevant and at the forefront. Um, we're excited to continue to collaborate with our statewide partners to not only have the health systems approach, but the community approach as well. Um, and then one of our newer projects is that we've been developing a formal quality improvement and value-based care curriculum for our trainees. Um, so all residents and fellows uh, will be having this as part of their training. And then we're looking towards getting more formalized feedback from patients and providers in a more systematic way around this initiative so that we continue to, can continue to improve it. Okay, thank you. Great, great conversation. Uh, really appreciate you sharing not only your results, but the work that you've done in order to make this campaign successful in your organizations. Before we go any further, let's get you involved. We're ready for you to join the conversation. If you go to the In the Ask Question window, please type your question or comment and click Submit. And we have a few questions already from the audience. So let's get to that. Our first one here is an interesting one in, in that it's an area we haven't discussed yet. Have you done any work around decreasing non-emergent emergency department utilization? So um, we have not yet. However, uh, we ha some of my colleagues in primary care have begun looking at our data to understand where our opportunities for improvement are. So it's, it's not well formulated it yet, but I know that's where we're working. Yeah, it, it's interesting. In the state of Kentucky, we've actually had a statewide initiative pulling in emergency departments because, frankly, this becomes a crisis when we're, our hospitals are overloaded. And I think if you ask any major academic medical center, they will tell you they have admitted patients in their emergency departments, and it's straining their resources. And the emergency medicine physicians are eager to take care of the sickest patients that need them, but have patients who could be cared for in the outpatient setting get that care out there. So it's an access issue as well as an educational one. And I think this is one of the key things that we need to undertake with population health. And uh, the patients, as we talked with them about care transitions, brought this up. If they don't know who they can contact when they develop symptoms, if they don't know who they can contact to ask questions and get a quick response, they are going to just go to the emergency room or call 911 because they've been trained. The ambulance services are very responsive and they will take the patient to the emergency department. And so it does need to be a community initiative. And part of that is the medical centers and practices providing access to these patients and showing them, we will be there for you. Any thoughts? Similarly to what Mark and Rob were saying, I'm not aware of any formal studies related to choosing wisely and the emergency department utilization but Duke is continuing to grow its care management program and try to work with these patients and the primary care and specialty providers to help prevent them from getting to the point where they feel like they have no other option and have to go to the emergency room. And this has been a focus not only in HIN, but in our Vizient TCPI grant as well. And it is a multi-modality uh, solution, I believe, access and that being in various forms, not only increasing hours, but increasing efficiency of the practices, telehealth, uh, many ways that patients can 
have contact with a provider outside of having going to emergency department. Uh, the other piece there is better preventative health and medication yeah. management. Yes. Uh, we see those as critical issues as yeah. well. So, yeah. And, uh, and go going back to that, what we have done in our community is we've, we have developed a program called CareLink Care Now, which is a, an uh, an adjunct mm -hmm. to providers. So we have a telehealth presence where we work with offices uh, to provide pharmacy, nursing, and to help and to contact patients to guide patients through some of this clinical decision making. Yeah. Uh, now, as Ali pointed out, it's not through the choosing wisely lens, but that's how we're trying to reduce some of our yeah. unnecessary ED visits. Yeah, and I think there's one important aspect that I always like to emphasize when people bring this up. Uh, and this is having done many, many years of care in emergency departments as well as hospital medicine. People will frequently blame the patient for coming to the emergency room when they didn't need to. And I think we need to blame the system that it wasn't providing the best option and access for that patient. And that's what we really need to focus on. And, and this is especially interesting when we look at new reimbursement policies like Anthem, who are saying that they're not going to reimburse for emergent mm -hmm. care if it truly was an emergent care and could have gone to a, a lesser level of, uh, of access, uh, urgent care or primary care physician. So this will be a continuing issue. We have a long question here from the audience, so bear with me. How do you address the competing needs of the patient and the organization? For example, the decision to order procedure while patient is an inpatient that is ideal for the outpatient setting, simply to save the patient time and money, which results in the organization not being reimbursed for the exam that fell outside of the DRG or admitting diagnosis. So again, I think this is an access issue. This comes up at our institution all the time. And a lot of this is because patients are getting transferred from rural Eastern Kentucky to the mothership academic medical center that has all these resources. And we're beginning to take this head on. Uh, we've posted a new position of having what we refer to as a hospital medicine care coordinator. And this is again, if you will, expanding our team, having a nurse who has that clinical acumen to work with the physician to coordinate that care. Um, in my personal experience is if you engage the patients and the caregivers in that conversation and we say to them, well, we can get this test, but it might take three, four days here in the hospital. You could be at home, sleeping in your own bed, eating your own food, and we'll set up a time for you to come and get this test. They're willing to do that. And we need to talk to our patients and caregivers and engage them. And I think they'll, they understand these things once you uh, explain it to them and, and are partners with them. Um, and so it is, it's a complete rethinking of what we do. It's amazing what can be done in the outpatient setting as far as care delivery. Things that we would routinely hospitalize patients for now can be completely managed in the outpatient setting if there's easy access and it's not a burden on the patients. And, and the other thing there is I think there are steps we can take to improve ambulatory efficiency, Absolutely. use of process improvement yes. methodologies, yes. linking leading indicators with lagging indicators, yep. so we improve efficiency and access no that way as well. Yep. But I think the most important part that Mark highlighted is it's involving the patient and their family, which is what choosing wisely. It's having that shared decision making right. about all the aspects, including the financial, uh, in making what's right, the right decision for the patient. Great point. Another question, any and unanticipated outcomes related to decreased utilization? We haven't per specifically looked at any possible adverse health effects, but none that have been reported to us, none that have been anecdotally reported to us from our work at Duke. So really. the, the pap smear example, decreasing unnecessary pap smears, have we seen an increase in cervical no, cancer, no. mortality, morbidity? Yeah, I think in general it's been shown pretty consistently that when we reduced our test utilization, outcomes stay the same or they actually improve because you avoid harm. And this is a place where leadership is, plays a pivotal role because the, yes. the leadership of the organizations have recognized that it may have a transient uh, hit to the bottom line, but this is what's right for, for the patient for the community and for our nation in this era of, of healthcare costs. And we spoke a little bit yesterday about the recent article in JAMA on carotid revascularization. 
and that has decreased in 15 years by over 50 percent mm -hmm. but we haven't seen a change in outcomes we've actually seen an improvement in outcomes sure. overall in that in that area so um, I think there's pretty good evidence starting to formulate around driving down unnecessary utilization doesn't have negative impacts for a patient. Another question from the audience, can any of you speak to how about, go about initiating and maintaining a line of communication with providers regarding ongoing quality initiatives to not only get their original buy-in, but maintaining? So how do we sustain <laughs> success by improved communication, not just that blip of success and then we fall back to where we've yeah. been traditionally. Well, and I would say engage them in the actual project. That's probably why you succeeded at Duke. A physician, a resident was involved in engaging the providers in this. Um, one of the things we did with Project Boost, which was again another care transition initiative where Boost stands for Better Outcomes by Optimizing Safe Transitions, we used something we called physician-mentored implementation. And the reason is, is because when you look at the literature, one of the number one factors of why quality improvement initiatives fail is those dang doctors. And I can say that because I'm a doctor. And <laughs> so what we did is had clinician, physician experts talk to the physicians and engage them. And so it was important to them. And once that happened, we were much more successful. And so I wouldn't say... Um, getting the physicians to accept quality improvement and sustain it, it's more asking them, how can you be involved in this? We want you involved in this. And here's this data that isn't showing the outcomes we really want. What ideas do you have to make this better? And they'll, physicians like to do the best. Problem solvers. Mm -hmm. This is how we were trained in college and medical school. We want to do the best. And so if we've got data showing we're not delivering the best care, we'll change our behavior. Additionally, as leaders in quality, safety, process improvement, the onus is on us is to make it easy for our providers yes. to do the right thing Absolutely. and hard for them to do the wrong thing. So the more that we can change our systems, the better off and the better buy-in and sustainment will, uh, will follow. Any last thoughts? No, I agree with what Mark and Rob have said. Yeah, the other thing I would say is we've talked about small tests of yeah. change but then socializing and scaling the results of that so everybody can buy in. And especially when it's happened in your organization, mm -hmm. it's local, it's people you know, yes. it's processes you know. So take those small t tests of change and, and socialize them within your organization yes. to maintain that, that improvement you've made. Yep. Okay, great program. Really appreciate the discussion. We've ran out of time for Q&A. So. Uh, well, we're at the end of our program. We hope this has encouraged you to take a look into Choosing Wisely, the Choosing Wisely campaign and consider how to get your organization involved. Rob, Allie, Mark, <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing your insights with us. And it's been a privilege to have you on the program. I'd also like to thank Dr. Matt, Matt Handley of Kaiser Permenti and Dr. Scott Weingarten of Cedar sinai for allowing us to interview them. And thanks also to the Vizient Hen for the ongoing support of this series. Finally, thank you for taking the time to join us today. If you've registered in advance, the program evaluation will be emailed to you. Please take a moment to complete it. Mark your calendars for the next web broadcast in this series on Wednesday, November 29th. In it, we will cover the very timely topic of opioid management and its part in conjunction with the Vizioid, Vizioid Opioid Awareness Campaign in which we will follow up with two interactive webinars that approach this topic in depth. Please check the schedule for the HIN Community Knowledge Network series to find the dates and times of those webinars. And now, from Vizient, I'm Dr. Robert Dean. Thank you for watching. <laughs>